everybody. Welcome to the Sunday edition of the Iron Man Conference. It's uh, Iron Family Sunday, I guess it is what we're going to call it, huh? All right, good. Uh, we had a fantastic day yesterday. We heard excellent messages um, from Ed and from Wallace, and it was a joy to be here. Um, but we have another opportunity to uh, hear from Ed and from Wallace uh, this morning. Uh, I want to introduce my friend Ed Ellis. I've known Ed for about, I guess, five to seven years, somewhere uh, along that uh, route. And the way I like to explain what Ed does is he takes very complicated matters or things that we tend to think as complicated and he makes them simple. That's what a teacher does, makes the complicated things understandable or simple. And I asked Ed for his bio and he said, tell him I'm a born again believer. So that's what Ed Ellis is. Ed is also on the board of the Evangelical Institute. He resides in Atlanta and he has written several books of which uh, the, are open for purchase in, in the vestibule um, between Sunday School and worship. But it's my pleasure this morning to introduce you to my friend Ed Ellis. Ed? Thank you. <clears throat> Are we on, Steve? Okay. It's been a real delight to uh, be with your men yesterday and with you all today. It was really encouraging to see that as an outreach, a lot of men showed up that weren't part of the Northgate family. That, that uh, is something to us. We had one uh, pastor show up with six or seven young men just to hear the message. And what's even more gratifying is when it looks like the eyes are opening. There's something going on behind the eyeballs. It's clicking. They're beginning to get it. And they haven't thought of it before. How many of you have a favorite quote I love quotes. I just love them. I've got a file at home with over a hundred pages of quotes. They're, to me, it's a gold mine. I collect them wherever I go. Why? Because I'm looking for some pithy pearl of wisdom that I can latch on to. Sometimes quotes are like guardrails. <clears throat> when you see them, you realize that helps define a path for me. It helps me know when I'm getting off the path and whether I'm staying on the path. And it helps me to know where the path ought to be. What's even better, though, is when I get a quote that connects me with a man or a woman, someone whose character I can connect with and realize this is coming from a source that has experienced this truth. That's even better. But what's most important to me ultimately is if I can find a quote that makes me think. It's not just information. Somehow it's penetrated my mind and my heart. It's made me want to think through or consider or investigate or research something that I haven't thought about before. It gives me insight and makes me think. <clears throat> There's a lot of opinions in the church today. And I'm very concerned that there is a lot of opinion, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of thinking that is biblically based going on. And the reason that concerns me today is because we do not seem to be able to meet the challenge of the culture that we're living in today. 
You know, in the first century, the disciples of Christ were facing every bit as much of a decadent culture, as much of a culture that was re rebellion against God as we are today. But they seem to be able to rise up and meet that challenge. We don't seem to be able to meet that. We don't seem to be able to have the same impact that they had. Why? Because again, as we all know, what's the power of God under salvation? The gospel. The gospel. And that message has not changed in 2,000 years. What impact is the gospel having on the culture today? What's changed? Either the message has changed or somehow lost its power, or the messengers have lost the message. Because we can't look out at the culture that we're living in and the results that we're facing and say everything's okay. It's not okay. But one thing we do know for certain that if the message has power, it's going to change the messenger as much as it is the culture. Or say it another way, if the message isn't working for you, why should I believe it? If it's not working for you, why should I make it part of my life? Why should I rearrange my life? Why should I consider what you've got to say, and that's an important question. The one question I want you to ask yourself today is Christianity working for me? We talked about this yesterday in, in the Iron Man conference. Is it working? Is it working? I'm not asking if you're saved. I'm asking you, is Christianity working for you? It's a little different question. And it's one you've got to think a little deeper about. Is it working for me? Has it changed my life in any significant way? Has it transformed me? Has it given me a different direction in life than the direction I was going to begin with? Is there a purpose that's now part of my life that wasn't a part of my life before I heard the message? Do I have any real evidence to back up my claim? Would anybody else testify to the change, to the transformation, to the difference? You know, the Bible is really clear. People describe it as, I was dead and now I'm alive. I was blind but now I can see. Yesterday when the Iron Man conference and the theme of our whole, uh, uh, the book and everything that we try to do was built around a man named Vince Lombardi. Some of you folks are old enough to remember Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi took over a devastatingly bad Green Bay Packer team in 1959. In 1958, they went 1-10-1. One, one. It's hard to be a professional team and be that bad. It really is. But they were. They were a disaster. And Vince Lombardi came in in 1959, and from that point on, they began to build a nine-year uh, winning 
Uh, dynasty, really, is the only word to describe it. They dominated the NFL, and now, at the end of every Super Bowl, they give out the Vince Lombardi Trophy to the best of the best, and they were the best. But the point that we try to make and what opened our eyes to using him as an example because the, the guidelines that he used to transform those losers, and they were, when you read the list of the men who were on that team, it is stunning. Bart Starr, Paul Hornig, Jim Taylor, Jim Ringo, Jerry Kramer, they were all on the losing team. And then next year, they had the first winning season in 15 years. And only one thing changed. Vince Lombardi became the head coach. He became the head coach, and he did two things. He took total control of the team. When you arrived in training camp, you knew who was in control. He had taken total control, and he convinced those players, if you will follow me, I will make you winners. That's all he did. And of course, the rest is now history. He did what he did. And he, he found men who would follow him, and he changed the NFL for at least those nine years. Winston Churchill once had a, a great quote. He said, no matter how beautiful the design of your strategy might be, eventually you need to check the results. At some point, you need to see whether or not what you're doing is working. Because if it is, things will change. They will change. About 400 BC, there was a Greek philosopher who was executed for corrupting the morals of the youth in the city of Athens. The man was Socrates. His crime was asking too many questions. Truly. His big question was, why are we worshiping these gods? He was challenging the status quo, asking, why should we be worshiping these gods? Because in his mind, they were telling him, the gods are all good, the gods are all powerful, what in the world are we doing, wasting our time offering these sacrifices? Because if they are good, they're going to bless us anyway. Well, the city fathers of Athens did not like that approach. And as far as they were concerned, he was getting these young people to do something he didn't want to do, or they didn't want him to do. So they tried him, and they found him guilty and they executed him. The, 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 the sentence was death, and he was executed. But at his trial, he made a statement which has been famous ever since. He said this, the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. How do you know whether what you're doing is making a difference if you don't examine it? How do you know whether or not what you're choosing to do matters? How do you know if you're wasting your life? You can live a life in which you deceive yourself into thinking you're doing something worthwhile or accomplishing something worthwhile, and in the end, you find out it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It didn't really matter. It didn't make a difference. If 
Yesterday in the Ironman conference, we quoted a, an evangelist you're probably all very familiar with named D.L. Moody. And he talked about this and made a profound statement. It's one of the most profound that I've ever come across, and I had never heard it before. But Moody said this. He said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. That should be our greatest fear in life, is not a failure. Anybody who stops to examine and think about it realizes failure is really not a problem. Most men who are considered successful often fail many times. Vince Lombardi, he had a quote. He said, failure is never final unless you quit. Failure is never final unless you quit. And God never quits on us. But Moody's statement is something that has to be considered over and over again. Our greatest fear should not be a failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. Why? Because if we succeed at something that doesn't matter, it means we wasted our life. It means we wasted our life. That's a sobering thought. Now, would a person purposely live their life knowing that they, what they're doing is a total waste? Not if they're rational, not if they're sane. But they could be deceived into thinking that what they're doing matters when it really doesn't. They could be deceived into thinking that. How do they get deceived usually? Because they want to believe it. They want to believe it. They desperately want to believe it. Let me ask you a question. How many believe the Bible is the word of God? That's about everybody. How many of you believe, well, let's do it differently. Look at the person on your left or on your right. Now ask yourself, do you believe that deep down in your heart they're basically a good person? I thought you said you believed in the Bible. <laughs> Both those statements cannot be true. Can't be true. There's a passage in Luke 18 that you're all very familiar with, so I'm not going to take our time this morning to, to read it. It's about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, you remember, ran up to Jesus and he said, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So obviously, it seems like he's thinking about the important question, the ultimate question. He wants to know, how do I inherit eternal life? Now, again, a ruler in, in Israel at that time, you know, he's a lawyer. I don't know whether they're trustworthy or not, but he's a lawyer. He's a legal expert. He's a technician. So what did the Lord do? Took him right to the point. He said, you started off with good teacher. And what did he say? The next verse, why do you call me good? There is none good except who? God alone. There is none good except God alone.
Paul confirmed the same thing in Romans 3, if you have any doubt. He said, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. And then he comes, it's like, you know, just in case you missed it, there is none good, there is not even one. So look back over to that person that you were looking at thinking they were good, just smile, just say sorry. Don't have to tell them I knew the truth all along. <laughs> a few years ago, I still haven't recovered from this. A few years ago, there was a TV show that gave one of the most vivid illustrations of this that I have ever seen. And it shows some of the capacity for deception that we're capable of. The show didn't last very long. I don't even know if it went a full season because it was obvious it was destroying lives. I mean, it was merciless. It really was. The premise of the game, it was a game show. It was called Truth or Dare. To win, all you had to do was be honest and tell the truth. Now, there was a lot of money at stake. You could win a half a million dollars. So obviously people would be lined up to try to play. Why? Hey, I'm willing to be honest. I'll tell the truth if you're giving me enough money. Now, how are they going to know if you're telling the truth? Well, they hook you up to a lie detector. You actually wore a lie detector. Now, again, we all know that there are certain people who could beat a lie detector, but you basically have to be a sociopath to do it. And most people aren't, so they really can't beat the system. And besides, these people are not going to give their money away without getting something for it. So they're going to put you through hours and hours and hours of questions and answers and research, and by the time they're done, they know where the skeletons are in your life, and they may know you better than you know you. Well, again, to win, all you have to do is be honest. One night this woman was in the chair on the stage. The show was in front of a live audience. They started asking her questions. Now again, obviously they're going to give you softball questions to start it off. You can pick up five, 10, 15, 25,000 because they want you to hang around. They've got some money invested in you. But after that, once you start hitting 50 grand, questions got more intense. Question started off this phase was, do you think you married the wrong person? Wow, that's a little intense. And her husband's sitting right there. Do you think you married the wrong person? There's a screen just like that one. And it's sitting up there and it's blank. And then the camera goes to the screen and all of a sudden you hear, ding, true. Because she said yes. Live on national television, I married the wrong person. Hmm. But she's got 50 grand in her pocket now. Well, now we're up to 100 grand. Have you ever cheated on your husband? Now remember, I guess I forgot to tell you, at any point in the game, 
you can quit and take home the money that you've won. She wants that hundred grand. Yes. Same truth. Now it's getting intense. You married the wrong person, you cheated on your husband. Next question, are you still in love with this other man? Well, why not? Yes, Dane. But she's got 250 grand. Doesn't have a marriage anymore, but she's got a quarter of a million dollars. Now she's going for the prize. Again, she can quit, walk away, have a quarter of a million dollars in her pocket. You know what the final question was? Do you still believe that you are a good person? Boy, just like this, it was quiet. Because everybody knew the right answer, except her. Yes. Eh. False. She could deceive herself, but she couldn't deceive the rest. Now, why in the world would she do that? Why would she say that? Because she desperately wanted to believe that she was basically deep down a good person. When it was obvious, she wasn't. And she lost it all. Like I said, that show didn't stay around a long time. It was costly. Deep down, we all want to believe we're good persons, but our capacity for self-deception seems almost unlimited. We desperately want to believe it. We know we should be, and we want to be. But the fact is, we are not. God knows the truth. Why? Because a good person wouldn't do the things that we do. Just wouldn't. The Lord told the rich young ruler there was only one good person, God. That's the truth we have to reckon with. There is only one good person, God. Now, theologically, you might want to say, wow, was he recognizing that Jesus was God? Not likely. He thought he was a prophet. He probably thought he had some real insight into spiritual things that he might know the answer and he was interested in whatever he had to say. But when Jesus said, there is, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God, that blew right over his head. Flew right past it. So Jesus just went on. The lesson to learn from that is if you don't examine your life in the light of the word of God, you can be as just as deceived as that woman was. But if you examine your life in the light of the Bible, in the light of the Word of God, you can't be deceived. You may be a little distressed over what you find, because the truth is sometimes hard to take, but you won't be deceived. And then you can find the grace of God. Now let's relate that idea and expand that into a biblical worldview and how that relates to living a life that matters because that's ultimately what we want to be able to help you do is to choose to live a life that matters. To make the right choices in life is going to depend greatly on how you view the world. What do we mean? Where's the conflict? There's two views. 
There's a biblical view and there's a cultural view. A biblical view and a cultural view. The cultural view of the world says you really are a good person deep down. You have enormous God-given potential. You have the opportunity and the ability to be extremely successful. In fact, God wants you to be successful and prosperous. You can be whatever you want to be. You just have to be willing to work for it. You have to be willing to do what it takes. Now, that all sounds pretty good. That's what we grew up with as the American dream. You can do what you want. You can be what you want. You can accomplish anything you want. You just have to be willing to work for it. What's the problem with that? In the end, it's really easy to identify why. Because it's all about you. The cultural view is all about you. It's about your dreams, your desires, uh, what you can achieve, what you want to accomplish for your satisfaction, and ultimately for your glory. That's a cultural view. You can try to paint it with oh yeah, I do it for God, but deep down, it starts with you, and it ends with you. It's not God at all. But you can deceive yourself into thinking it's for God. A biblical worldview is very different. There's no way to confuse it. It starts out with the basic understanding you're not a good person. You're not a good person. You're a sinner. You're a rebel against God. You have turned away from God and you've gone your own way. As Paul said, they have all turned aside. Together they have become useless. That word useless is a very specific word. It means it is no longer able to fulfill the function for which it was created. Man, as a rebel against God, as a sinner, is no longer able to fulfill the function for which God created him. He's lost that ability. And until he turns in repentance and faith and is born again, he doesn't have the ability to do anything else but fulfill his own desires for his own sake and for his own glory. He is lost. Second thing that a biblical worldview will do, you will realize and see that this whole culture is exactly what the Bible describes as the world which lies in the power of the evil one. Go to 1 John 5. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. This whole system, the culture, in case you haven't figured it out, the world and the culture are the same thing. And they're all designed, not by God, but by the devil, to do one thing, to deceive you into thinking that if you live your life as a good person, doing a few good things along the way, being nice to people, being generous to some people, but all the while focused on satisfying your dreams and your goals and your desires and trying to achieve what you want to achieve and thinking that you accomplished your mission. That's all the devil wants from you. He wants you to make the most of your life that you possibly can. I mean, let's face it. We live in America. 
that's a pretty attractive deal. If you're living in Sudan, you don't see much what? Potential. If you're living in Greenville, there's all kinds of potential. but it's also the potential for deception. If there are any doubts, certainly the last 10 to 15 years in America and the decline that we've experienced ought to convince us. This is not a Christian culture. We're facing days and it is stunningly, staggeringly coming fast where for you to stand up for a biblical worldview could land you in a prison somewhere because you're going to be considered a hater. You're going to be considered a hater. That day is not. You know, 10 years ago, we might have had a, a discussion, ah, maybe someday. Someday's here. Someday's here. So we can't afford the seat how does the devil do it? What's his strategy? Where's the trap? Well, 1 John 2 lists it out. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He hasn't changed his strategy since the Garden of Eden. Why? Well, every good coach knows that if you've got a winning play, you don't change it. Right? Right? You keep running it until it doesn't work anymore. And that play is working. It's working now better than ever before. I don't know what about his strategy is your particular trap. Lust of the flesh is all oh, the sensual delight and, and distractions and the addictions and all the things that come with the sensual world that's out there today. You know, that could be what traps you. The pride or the um, lust of the eyes, you know, the same thing. You may be a prisoner of greed or, or just coveting the things and, and being driven by the things you long for and what you want. But a big one that most people don't realize is the pride of life. The pride of life. What you can accomplish for your sake what you can accomplish because you have a dream, you have a desire, you have something you want to fulfill, you've got so much potential, and parents are as deceived as their kids because they see this potential in their kids and they want to develop it, they want to see them succeed, and they want them to have all the things they didn't have. They don't see it's a lie. It's a delusion. The worst part about it, as Moody said, is you might succeed. You might succeed in fulfilling all your dreams. You might succeed in accomplishing the goals that you had for your life. We used an example yesterday. Steve Jobs started Apple. Died a billionaire. Sold billions of phones. Had several billion dollar companies. Everybody walks around with an iPhone. Do you think God cares how many people use an iPhone? Do you think when Steve Jobs faces judgment, is he trying to tell me something? Do you think it matters how many iPhones have been sold in heaven? I hate to say it, but the reality is true. If the Bible is true, his life didn't matter. He fulfilled all his goals, all his dreams, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Now, the deception is just as real for us if we succeed in the pursuit of the world. 
the Lord Jesus makes it absolutely clear, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What does it matter? Where's the profit? A lot of you out there are businessmen. Where's the profit? If you, if you, if you pursue a cultural worldview, you can be deceived. If you don't start with a biblical foundation where your life is transformed, you're going to be deceived. It won't matter. How do we know what's the ultimate proof? I heard it, some of you did in the meeting. You're going to die. We hate to think about it. We hate to look at it. We hate, we just do everything we can to try to ignore it. But the fact of the matter is, you're going to die. And everything that you've accomplished for your sake in this world, achieving your dreams, is going to what? Die with you. And if that was the focus of your life, then it was a waste. Your life was a waste. C.T. Studd is a name that Hopefully it's familiar, but it may not be as well known as some others. He made a statement. We only have one life. It will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now, those of you who don't know C.T. Studd, C.T. Studd was the Tim Tebow of his day. He was a world-class athlete at Cambridge. In England. Everybody knew his name. He was admired by everybody. You know, with Tebow, you see these announcers on TV, you know, and they want to say, well, you know, his skills as a quarterback and professional is just not like, it is not like it was in college. But you'd love to have him marry your daughter. They acknowledged his character. He was just incredibly respected. Even by people who have no concept of who God is and couldn't care less, but they had to acknowledge, wow, I wish my daughter would bring a guy like this home. But that's who C.T. Studd was. And he was very wealthy, came from a very wealthy, influential family. His father got converted under D.L. Moody's ministry. And his dad dragged him and his brothers to Moody's campaigns when he was in England. He graduated from Cambridge and he decided that what God was now calling him to do was be a missionary. And man, everybody, oh, his family, they were dying. What are you thinking? Look at all the potential of your life. You've got wealth, prestige. You're, nobody knows who you are in China. How are you going to have an impact in China? Doesn't it make more sense to stay here and use your influence to make an impact? Sounds convincing. He was convinced that God had another plan. But before he ever left, he and another buddy, Stanley Smith, were both convinced that God wanted them to go to China and join Hudson Taylor in the China Inland Mission. And before long, he was traveling all over England because the word got out. You know, if the word got out, Tim Tebow was going to be doing something, everybody, they all want him to come speak. And he went through all of England for a year speaking at student meetings. A revival broke out when he and Stanley Smith traveled around to all these students to tell them of their faith in Christ and the call to go to China, he made an impact. It mattered what he did. And there was five more of those Cambridge graduates. They became known in history as the Cambridge Seven. And they all went out 
to join Hudson Taylor. And over the next few years, Studd served for about 45 years as a missionary. First in China, then in India, finally in the heart of the African Congo. And he died there. Why? People, and and he, he suffered, he sacrificed, he gave away all of his wealth what he inherited it. Sat down and wrote big checks. Moody, uh, the Moody Bible School was founded. He was one of the, the, the founding uh, partners with Moody. Uh, wrote him a big check in order to, uh, to do that. George Mueller did a, a, a lot to, all over the place. Why? Well, he said, hey, the Lord said he'd take care of us. Okay, here it is, bang. People said he suffered, and he did. He sacrificed. And somebody tried to talk to him one day about that sacrifice that he made for the Lord. You know what his response was? It's a great quote. If Jesus Christ be God, and he died for me, what sacrifice am I making for him? How could he say that? Because he had a biblical worldview. He died, his life was hid with Christ and God. Examine your life. Ask the big question. Does anybody, would anybody testify that there's been a change in me? Do I see a difference in the direction of my life because of my faith in Christ? Am I different or am I deceived? Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and we just thank you again for your word. We thank you for the truth of that word, that we can record on that at every point, in every way. We don't need to be deceived, and we don't have to live lives that don't matter. We can simply surrender those lives to you, give you total control, and follow you. We can trust you with all the results. Just as the Apostle Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I believe that he can take care of all that I have entrusted to him until that day. And we come, we just ask you, Lord, to guide us into the truth, Lord, to draw us to yourself, Lord, and enable us to glorify you truly. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.